Thank you very much, Doug. It really is a pleasure to be back here in this magnificent building, this 18th century library, uh, which I think is one of the architectural marvels of the United States, and everybody should come here to see it. Um, and I'm delighted to be back here again. Now, this book, which is a big, fat book, uh, can be used as a doorstop if you decide not to read it. it, it it'll work that way. The title of the book comes from a, com a, a statement of Jefferson's. He referred to the United States, Jefferson being the most expansive-minded president in our history, he referred to the United States that he was president of as an empire of liberty. Uh, a different kind of empire is what he saw. A and he, as I said, had great visions for the growth of this United States. Now, I've introduced this book uh, with a little brief description of Rip Van Winkle's, uh, uh, Washington Irving's story, Rip Van Winkle, which I think captures some of the cha extraordinary changes that took place in this period between 1789 and, and, uh, uh, and 1815. And in fact, uh, from the revolution to the second decade of the 19th century. Irving, who was conservative, had conservative sensibilities, wrote this short story, which I think is his most famous short story. Most of you are familiar with it. Uh, in the second decade of the 19th century, and I think it, he was trying to express some of the uh, awesome changes that he had experienced in his own lifetime. Um, and, and I think an, he had developed an acute sense that his native land was no longer the same place that it had been uh, a generation earlier. Uh, he had his, his, his character, if you recall, uh, Rip, awakened from a sleep that had begun before the revolution and had gone on for, for 20 years or so. And when M Rip enters his old village, he immediately felt lost. The buildings, the faces, the names were all strange and incomprehensible. The very village was altered, wrote uh, Irving. It was larger and more populous. And idleness, except among the aged, was no longer tolerated. The very character of the people seemed changed. There was a busy, bustling, disputatious tone about it. Instead of the accustomed, drowsy tranquility, a terrifying situation for Rip, of course, who had, no, who had an insuperable aversion to all kinds of profitable, profitable labor. And that's a cru crucial point, that labor or work had become celebrated in, in the short period following the revolution. Even the language was strange, said Irving. Rights of citizens, elections, members of Congress, liberty, and other words which were perfect Babylonian jargon to the bewildered Van Winkle. When people asked him on which side he voted and whether he was federal or a Democrat, Rip could only stare in bewildered stupidity. Now, this story, Rip Van Winkle, became the most popular of Irving's many stories. Uh, for I think 18th century Americans appreciated uh, the, the, the notion that the world had been transformed in, in a very short period of time. Superficially, the leadership seemed the same. Uh, George Washington replaced uh, George III on a sign outside the tavern. But beneath the surface, everything was changed. Uh, and that's a quote from the story. In a few short decades, America underwent I think, a fantastic transformation in politics, in society, in the culture. Uh, and, and I think most people wondered what had happened and who were they at the end of this, uh, of this period uh, in the decades following the revolution. Before the revolution, America had been a, uh, a collection of disparate British colonies composed of some two million subjects huddled along the Atlantic coast 3,000 miles from the centers of civilization. European outposts, so to speak, whose cultural focus was still London, the metropolitan center of the empire. By 1815, uh, following the Second War with Great Britain, which was often referred to as the Second War of Independence, uh, these insignificant provinces had become a single giant continental republic with nearly 10 million citizens, many of whom had already spilled over the Appalachians into the Western territories. The cultural focus of this new, huge, expansive nation was no longer abroad, but was instead directed inward at its own uh, boundless possibilities. Americans knew they were a grand experiment in democracy, but they were confident that they could, by their own efforts, remake their culture, recreate what they were. Uh, 
uh, recreate their beliefs and their thoughts. Their revolution told them that people's birth did not limit what they might become, hence the importance they gave to education. And in fact, I think this period has more publications uh, on, on education per capita relative to population than at any time in our history. Uh, many of these ideas didn't get implemented until the next generation, but the ideas were laid out, like Jefferson's plans for a three-tiered system of public education, were laid out for others, uh, like Horace Mann from Massachusetts, to implement. Suddenly, I think, everything seemed possible to this post-revolutionary generation. The revolutionary leaders were faced with the awesome task of creating, out of their own British heritage, their separate national identity. And that becomes a major problem for them. How do you separate yourself with the sa having the same language, the same heritage, many, many of them with the same religion? How do you become Americans? And that, if you can think about the principal issue separating England from America, that eventually led to the War of 1812, it was impressment. That taking of, British taking of American sailors or sailors off of American ships and, and impressing them into the British Navy. Uh, that became the crucial issue that led to war and it becomes a crucial issue because you can't tell a British sailor from an American sailor and that uh, aggravated the whole problem. Americans now had an opportunity to re uh, realize an ideal world, to put the broad-minded and tolerant principles of the Enlightenment into practice. Uh, to become a homogeneous, compassionate, and cosmopolitan people, and to create the kind of free society and the illustrious culture that people, since the ancient Greeks and Romans, had only yearned for. But I think in the end, little worked out as these founders, as we call them, expected. The society became much more democratic, much more populist than anyone had, had expected. So in a generation's time, these Americans experienced as great a transformation as, as we've ever had, I think. Now we, of a certain age, remember over the last 50 years, say from 1960, early 1960s to today, have undergone a tremendous cultural transformation. And anybody who's old enough to remember what it was like back before the 1960s knows what I'm talking about. But I think these, this generation underwent an even greater transformation. Uh, in their culture, in their society, in their politics, uh, that makes our that that I think uh, gives us some perspective on the changes that we've experienced. Now, this transformation also took place before industrialization, before urbanization, before railroads, or before any of the technological uh, inventions that we usually associate uh, with with uh, modern social change. In the decades following the revolution, uh, Americans changed so much that they uh, came, became used to change and came to celebrate change, thinking that that was a good thing, which was rare in the history of the world. First of all, the population grew dramatically, doubling every 20 years or so, uh, as it had been doing for several generations. It was growing twice as fast as any nation in Europe. Uh, and people were on the move as never before spreading themselves over half a continent at astonishing speeds. Between 1790 and 1820, New York's population quadrupled. <coughs> Kentucky's multiplied eight times. In a single decade, Ohio grew from a virtual wilderness, except, of course, for the 10,000 Indians or so uh, that um, white Americans scarcely acknowledged. But in that decade, it grew from no white people to become more populous than most of the century-old colonies had been at the time of the Revolution. In a single generation, Americans occupied more territory than they had occupied in the previous 150 years of the colonial period. So we have this outpouring of people, uh, growing population, uh, incredible kind of uh, dynamic that I think is, underlies much of the change. Although Americans in 1815 remained farmers living in uh, rural areas, they had become, especially in the north, and many of these changes I'm talking about were northern, which helps explain the sectional split that takes place. Uh, 